Okay. So um, let's just start day two. Okay. I hope you had a good. Uh, or the poster is still down there. Um, so you collected everything and brought them back up. Okay. One, two, three, three. Um, before we start, let me ask. Uh, there was a sign-up sheet for the hike tomorrow. Okay. How many people in this audience right now are going to the hike tomorrow? How difficult is that? It's not actually too bad. If I would recommend it. I would recommend it. Okay. Uh, there'll be water, there'll be so, so if you I, I would recommend that you do not miss it. I will have to miss it for obvious reasons, but uh, but you should not. So let me just see the hands again. How many of you have not signed? Sure. Right. <laughs> because because Kim will need it in order to order the bus and all of this stuff. You know, you get your boxes in uh, your, your lunches in boxes with you when you go on the bus. So uh, so please do so uh, after after the Ferdinand's lecture, let's say. Okay, without further ado, let me yield the floor to Bernard, please. Great. First, thank to you to bring us here. And these are impressions from our place here. It's pretty uh, special here, okay? I, I really like it. So, uh, did you take that photo? Yes. Wow. Yes. Uh, now, the problem is it moves the wrong screen, whatever happens here. No, it doesn't work. Ah. Yes, okay. So that's the menu. Would be inner, inner parts of a, of a machine, which is uh, something up here. Well, on the top, introduction to trap lines. You put the USB thing in there. Yeah, yeah, but it doesn't work. No, no, I don't care. Do you have a stick, by, by the way? A really long stick would be also good. This is all going This here? Okay, so, so I will talk about all the movements you need. The, 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 yeah, the laser pointer? I, 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 I don't like it. No, because. You had it uh, yeah, right, yeah. wrong side. Yeah. I agree. A physical thing is better. No, it, it, it seems to work. Now it works. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. So this is all about the inner wheels of an iron trap machine, okay, which I described today. It's about these atoms, how they are trapped. It's about how we cool them, it's about what kind of eigenmodes they have, what kind of, how do we implement a spin one half system on them. And then in the second lecture, I will talk about its engines and I will start with uh, a single iron engine, which is classically, but still it's on single iron. Then I will go a little bit stepwards towards quantum operation. And in the third lecture, I will go really to uh, misusing a quantum computer for doing uh, engines or quantum thermodynamic processes in general. So that is a, here we have still the motion involved, here we have only the spins involved. Sorry, we got disconnected again. Yeah, this, uh, I, I, maybe I we, we will not stop here, reconnecting, disconnecting, Reconnecting. Yeah, I know. So but maybe uh, we'll give it one try. Okay. We give it one try. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you have you just started. So maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Um, and I, and I think it's because again you see it's yeah, but um, now it's okay. Yeah. All right. Let's try. If it unconnects yeah from its own, I be yeah. more mercy actually. You know. Right. Now this doesn't click again. <laughs> Come on. Is it the right side? It is too silly. <laughs> Come on. 
This is a whole mess. Okay. So when I start my Yes. No, I think it's the, I think now it's working, but the, it's, so you go and yeah, I think this, this is working. Yeah, well, some things are working sometimes and then they are stopping working. Yeah. Um, some reason your uh, your Zoom or the way Oh, my Zoom up. is now the guilty one, no. <laughs> no, I don't believe it. No, no, it, it keeps muting your video. I yes. That's the issue. Well, I don't know why. It doesn't show another. So I. Oh, maybe the. Come on. There's one person on board. That's Jacqueline. And. Doesn't Something start the video. Something you see, it doesn't stop the video. So just. Uh, Now you're on. Yeah, sometimes I'm on, the, sometimes I'm not. Yes, of course. So how stupid is this? It's really... Hmm. Really, well, we have time. Now we have we time. Back. Yes. So, okay, now we go on. Okay. Without mercy for the other ones. Okay, this is my personal understanding of the landscape of thermodynamics. So we have a large system and we have just the average value. And this is the, there are many degrees of freedom, many particles. It is mostly in the equilibrium, or very close to it, and the calculation part. If you go to small systems, like uh, bio systems or a single atom, but you're not really in the deep quantum machine, then you have few degrees of freedom. And then this work probabilities distribute become wide. And you can uh, see fluctuation fields, for example. You see the, the engine doesn't deliver one watt always, but it has an average of one watt. And that means sometimes more, sometimes less. You see thermal fluctuations. You see the fluctuation schemes working and probably most of this also. Now you go to quantum systems, and this is different from here. I feel this is really different because here some other things happen. The, first of all, these degrees of freedom are quantized, this one point, but then you have also to deal with superposition and entanglement. And, and so if you are then dealing with these quantum heat engines or quantum thermodynamics, you have this probabilistic nature of the quantum processes. This is still fluctuations, but it can be a little bit different because you can now measure different axes and you can see whether operators commute or not. And that is different from, from here. And so the measurements of the system can be better, but not necessarily better. So you can make measurements which do not matter so much and you can make, make measurements which are Mattering a lot. And then the correlation with the environment can also matter. And you can also drive non classical reservoirs. So, this is what I think is what then you are already doing a quantum thermodynamics. Yeah? And there, there is a distinction between these two. Okay. So, sorry. So, my goal is to do experiments in quantum thermodynamics. Yeah. Or I better say experiments in thermodynamics involving quantum systems. And then we will decide whether it is quantum thermodynamics or still small system thermodynamics. 
And uh, I think that these experiments are really enlightening because you can then understand the concepts much more. At least me, I can understand it better if I do an experiment as compared to writing down uh, the thing is because it gets materialized. Okay, that makes me understand things much better. And with our uh, from single, we want then to scale up to many coupled quantum systems with computer interaction. That is then a multi-particle quantum system engine. And also the temperature, you can either cool it down or you can eject heat. You can control the temperature also to a higher level. You can control dissipation. And also you have internal and external degrees of freedom where you can write engine cycles. And also it is interesting to measure the observables in X, Y, Z directions, or to measure <clears throat> in the duration of the process and involve the operation of the engine, like uh, a daemon measurement, where you measure in between and get some information. And this way you can also uh, look into a coherence and entanglement and how this modified is modified by the observer by measuring in between. And last but not least, this is really a message from you because I think everybody here is uh, theoretician. Okay. No, there are some experiments. Okay, I'm happy to hear this. Not alone. Not completely alone, but this is really what I want to build, and I'm very close to this. Part of this is already existing, part is not yet. So I want to build the cloud access to a quantum computer where you can run the engine cycles now on the spins, which are detecting. And then also, and that is in process, in progress, uh, access to a spin boson machine where you can address the motion degrees of freedom and the spins in a user interface. So you have your your, your Python uh, script, and then you type in what kind of crystals you want, ion crystal, what kind of interaction you like, what kind of cooling you want to have, what kind of observation you want to have, and then you run the thing. And then you get the data. So that is what we are building currently. We have already a quantum computer where you can access in principle, but it's not online 724. So it is not all the time on, but when we make it ready, then one can access it. And we want to make it really accessible around the clock. And also we are working on the spin boson machine. Here we plan to access it. Okay, and then my question is, of course, why do we like to have ions for this purpose? Okay, you could use NB centers or, or maybe other systems, Rutberg atoms, I don't know, a lot of things. I think the advantage of ions are here. They can be laser cooled and trapped and actually are trapped for hours or days with power traps, and they can be cooled down to the motion of ground state of a harmonic oscillator. And then they share the motion of a harmonic oscillator. And this is a really perfectly understood model system. It is also scalable. You can put more and more ions, and then you can increase the number of degrees of freedom in this uh, system. And you can control the interactions. The interactions are driven by laser beams, and these interactions are instrumental to drive them in engines. You can also use them as complete isolated systems, but you can also design reservoirs and inject some heat, for example, with lasers or with other means. And this makes it possible to, uh, to design some work cycles and uh, using these internal spin degrees of freedom here in the ions and the external vibration degrees of freedom. And the, one of the engines we are building is a quantum computer. So a quantum computer is, in the larger sense, also a quantum thermodynamic machine, I think. For example, if you are employing quantum error correction, then you are sucking out entropy out of the system and dissipate it via an auxiliar measure. That is a very uh, typical quantum thermodynamic process. It is not understood as this, but it has a lot to do with it. It's also a periodic cycle. So this is very 
very similar, and it shows that the quantum computer can be used in this thermodynamic uh, uh, sense. Okay, that's the menu of today. I want to introduce you to time techniques and methods that you know what are these wheels and and uh, in what is inside a quantum uh, machine which deals with trap ions. And I will talk about this dynamic trapping, how you generate a harmonic potential then, and how these ion crystals form and what kind of motion frequencies and eigenvectors they have. And then I will talk about how you control the states, the internal and the external degrees of freedom, how you control with laser, laser light, uh, that involves cooling, but also initialization of the spins. And of course, one very beautiful thing is that you can take up the laser light the spin spin direction. And uh, this can be done in very different fashions. And then I will uh, add here some measurements by Hartmut Hefner here from Berkeley. He did some heat transport measurements and some spin dependent heat transport measurements. And this is also followed in this research unit, Fukuhima, uh, which you have the web page here. So uh, this is the menu of today. And let's start here with this uh, nice pictures of the lines. So you see these atoms one by one. There are several groups in the world doing this uh, in Boulder, in Ormus. Here you see a, a really thick and big crystal out of a lot of magnesium ions and some calcium ions here. Uh, this is from Innsbruck. You see the motion, the breathing motion of an ion crystal in slow motion uh, video, so to say, stroboscopic picture of these ions moving. And you can form ion crystals here. You see some defects in the ion crystal. These are just other isotopes of uh, mercury, which are not emitting light. So you can have you have a lot of freedom to have various different ions. And we are we like this calcium 40 very much, and we, we are sticking to this in the photo. So, how do we confine these ions? In a culture, yes. I want to ask, can you go quickly go back? Yes, sure. What's happening with the last two ions in the breathing picture? Or like the why do they become faint? Yes, or like the, the one below it where they disappear towards the end. Well, they, they don't really disappear, but they become a little bit faint. And that is a combination of first of all, there's a Doppler effect if they are so fast, they are they are going out of resonance. With the cooling laser because they're so fast uh, when they are oscillating uh, and the second is that the laser is mostly focused in the center and that means they just uh, go out of the light and they do not get excited any longer so efficiently and that means that they become a little bit darker that is also the reason why uh, this here is faint yeah because the laser light hits the center here more than the outer side yeah? so it's very simple Okay, how do we confine ions? The first problem is you want to bind harmonically in three dimensions, and you need a potential which goes squared in all dimensions, y, z. And then if you take the derivative, then you would have a harmonic restoring stress. That's what you want to have. Now, the problem is that this doesn't work in three dimensions because of the plus equation. So the Laplace equation means you take the derivative to x, to y, and to z two times, and that is zero because there's the electrode outside, okay? And so at least one of these coefficients here in front of x, y, or z has to become negative. And that means there's binding in x and y, for example, and anti-binding the z direction. So that is a problem, uh, and it doesn't work, okay? You cannot bind with a static field in three dimensions. And that was the starting yeah. point when uh, Wolfgang Paul was coming up with his invention. And he said, just put an alternating field to this ring electrode and have zero volt on this end gap. This is the cut to this uh, song. And then you have in one moment, you have a, a restoring force in X and Y which is good, which is harmonic binding, but it is anti-binding in Z. 
And then you switch the voltage and then it's binding in Z on anti-binding X and X and Y. So you put an alternating voltage. That means you make one coefficient, you make positive and one negative. That allowed that is allowed for the Laplace equation. That is okay. But you make a time dependent that this becomes negative and then becomes positive and so on. Why so this? Question. Yes. Is, is there a reason you focus on quadruple voltage only? Well, we want to have a harmonic protection. A harmonic protection has a lot of advantage later on. You will see if, if the uh, protection is non harmonic, then uh, the energy from N to. Um, but you can harmonic with dipole interaction. Um, Harmonic no, you want a harmonic confining potential. Okay. So that makes later for you, for example, possible. And that makes, uh, we will see in a moment that this is really of a lot of advantage. And this is a mechanical example of this uh, potential, which has an anti binding in this direction and binding in this direction. And I build this, and you can just uh, rotate this um, thing here. So I hope it works. Why no, doesn't it st doesn't start? Today we have a lot of technical problems. Well, it's a rotating saddle potential that's amazingly stable. That the ion is sitting in the center. And uh, sorry, the video doesn't work. Maybe if you uh, pardon. Maybe if you run the video outside of the picture. Yeah, yeah. Something is really. Who's running? Just the last. This has to do with this bad hole here. I think that looks at me and it's, it's even, huh? Well, it's to me. Yeah. It, it no. Okay, well. So outside here, again here, you see binding in X and one, but anti-binding, and you have to make the coefficient two in order to compensate, and then you make a time-dependent potentially, time-dependent. And this is now oscillating with a high frequency omega R at the point. And if you now plug in this into the equation of motion, yeah, the force to attract charged particle, then you have an equation, a new equation where the acceleration on this uh, charge is according to the electric field, which is then oscillating, and this is then the whole equation. You can solve for this, and if you solve it, then you get the Mathieu equation. So that is now a differential equation, which looks like a harmonic oscillator a little bit, but it's not quite a harmonic oscillator because that is time dependent here. And now you can substitute some coefficient here, at A and Q, take this uh, and make it a standard form. And then if you solve for this, then you find out that it's about a harmonic oscillator, not quite, but about a harmonic oscillator. So it's amazing that you put just the time, this time dependent potential here in front of it. And you would say, okay, if I if I average, if I do this very fast, then I have net zero, okay? Because sometimes binding, sometimes anti-binding, you would say, okay, how can it work? But you plug it in, it's working, it's working. You find then for these values to be, if they are small against one, then there are some approximate solutions which look really like a harmonic oscillator, which oscillates the, the trajectory is a cosine with a certain oscillating frequency, we call it a secular frequency. But then there is also fast oscillation with this driving. So the oscillation is slow. And then on top of this, there is a wiggling oscillation, the fast one, this one, okay? And this harmonic frequency depends now on the strength of the drive and the frequency of this drive. So we get a so-called pseudo-potential, and this pseudo-potential is now described 
by like a harmonic oscillator. So we have a harmonic oscillator, harmonically bound trapped ions, only in this uh, in this approximation when this drive frequency is very fast against this second level. Okay. And now let's switch to a two-dimensional potential. Two-dimensional mass filter potential where you have the y direction and the x direction. Now we have to solve the Laplace equation in two dimensions. We cannot make it binding for x and y at the same time. So we have the minus here, the plus there. We do the same trick as before, and then we get the material equation here for x and y, okay? Binding and binding with these time dependent coefficients. Yeah? What's the motivation for moving to two dimensions? Exactly. Why do we go for two dimensions? Before we had one single point at the center of the device where we can trap a particle with a charge in the mass. But we want to have a linear ion crystal. And that's the reason why we have this linear mass filter. So far, the ions can fall out of the remote ends. And that is, of course, not great. But now we can plug the ends just with the DC voltage here and here. So then the ions are confined in the center in the radial direction in X and Y. They are confined by the pseudo potential. And in the Z direction, they are confined because of this is a positive charge and this is a positive charge. Anchor. So that is a DC confinement in Z direction and the radial confinement in X and Y. And this is called the linear ion. That's what all people use. So that is used by continuum and so on in some or the other way. Huh? For the RF frequency, it has to be faster than secular motion. Much What's faster, the, like, typically order of magnitude, yes. And is there an upper bound for frequency as well? Like it should it, be upper than something else? Yeah. Um, well, you see here, if you go very fast, then this Q becomes very small. And then we are almost left with no binding. So if this radio frequency is going to be very, very fast, then the secular frequency shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, and you don't like to go there. So a soft spot is that you have a Q of say 0 0.2 or so, where you are fast, but not so fast that it disappears. And what's the Typical that? operation are, this is maybe 50 megahertz, and this is maybe five megahertz or two, yeah? What's beta I physically? Um, What's the beta i physically? Uh, the beta is just the, uh, the, this value, it's the, the ratio here times two. So it is a, a approximate. Yeah, we, we. Okay, now we have this linear ion crystal because the confinement in radial direction is much stiffer. We suppose to have much stiffer confinement in x and y. And in z, we have a a static potential, which is more loose, okay? That means the ions arrange in the z-axis as a linear ion crystal, okay? Under the harmonic confinement in the z-axis, so here is the positive charged electron, here is a positive charged electron. And now we want to calculate what are these equilibrium positions. So how do we calculate them? This is a mutual Coulomb uh, um, uh, repulsion. So these ions have Coulomb repulsion with each other, that is this part, and they are sitting in a harmonic, overall uh, harmonic potential. So this, this is now x, y, z, and here it is z component, which I uh, I'm mostly interested in. And these components, you can now calculate where the equilibrium positions are. And now these ions oscillate about these equilibrium positions. So the typical distances are about three or five micron here. So you can easily resolve them with optics. But now they have little oscillations about their, their uh, equilibrium positions. And that's what you can now calculate. You have to take the derivatives and look what are the oscillation frequencies. For this, you take the Lagrangian, that's the kinetic energy, the potential energy. And here is the kinetic energy, that's the 
overall harmonic potential, and that's the Coulomb repulsion. And we take the derivative and we cut here and say with the higher derivatives, we are not interested. Okay. We take the harmonic approximation, so to say, of the Coulomb detection, because they are still Coulomb detecting, with, and we're now claiming that there are just springs between designs, which is, of course, not true. But if you have very small experiments only, it's okay to say this. And then you can calculate these derivatives, and it's in the matrix. And this matrix is here. That's the matrix we should take. Here is the, the Coulomb interaction between designs, and this is the leftover of the harmonic projection. So if you now take the, the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of this matrix, you get the eigenvotes, like how the vectors, how, how the oscillations are. You have a common mass mode like this, the vectors are pointing in the same direction, or you have a greedy mode, yeah, vectors are pointing opposite. And for each of these modes, of this of each of the eigenmodes, you take the uh, this matrix here, you take the eigenvectors and eigenvectors, and that generates that tells us about the eigenmodes and the uh, oscillation frequencies. And then I say it is it's this Coulomb detection which drive these modes, but we have taken the harmonic approximation only, and this next term will lead to a mixing between different modes. Okay, and that's very small because the, the excursions are in the range of a few ten uh, nanometer, and the distances are maybe five micrometers. So you can take this approximation safely. The next term is small. But it can, it is there. Okay. Have you considered uh, radiative effects? You have these dipoles and quadrupoles that are oscillating. You have emission of radiation. Uh, that can be also observed. Yes. Here we we um, we we don't take this, but you can. Well, it's it's a um, yeah. You can enhance it if you have more ions and they're oscillating all in phase. Then you have a. Um, what is this? Yeah, yeah, it's so it's a concentration of the dipoles. Yeah. Yes, you yeah. can. You can. You can use this also. Yeah. yeah. What, so, what radiation? Well, if you are, um, what you no, just uh, charges that are oscillating. You yeah. Why get radiation? Why would they radiate? Because you have only charge that there's something. Yes, it's oscillating. It doesn't need to be. It is an antenna. It's not. Well, it is. Yeah. It is basically a, a long range coupling which we yeah, have so established, but it's all in a dipole antenna class that they have heard. Yeah, that's all. People have observed this. If you if you separate an ion crystal, uh, you, you here the ions are strongly coupled, the, the distances are high, might be the, really are common, strongly coupled modes. Now, if you are taking one eye far away, then it's basically an oscillation here and oscillation here. You can make them resonant, and then they have resonant exchange. Now, it is a, a very slow interaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this oscillation will then go to this oscillation and back and forth. Yeah. That's what we do. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So now we control the, the states with laser light. We have so far on only our kinetic energy of the ions and the potential energy. And uh, we, have, we have to treat this quantum mechanically. We are coming now to a quantum common oscillator and we cast this uh, motion, sorry, this motions here into the operators. So then, if we do this, we have to take this uh, free factor into account. And then we get, we end up with a harmonic oscillator of this kinetic energy. So now the eigenstates are well known, the harmonic oscillator, of course. And we have this uh, raising and lowering operators, which bring us from state n with n phonons uh, down to n minus one with this. Uh, Prefactor here, or bring it from n up to n plus one with this prefactor. That's really the harmonic oscillator which we realize now in real life in an experiment. 
This is the harmonic oscillator wave functions. And here they are. And that is now important that they are all equidistant. And that is really important that we started with harmonic oscillator. Because otherwise, it is very hard to control uh, the motions if all the vibration degrees of freedom would be different. We don't want that. Okay? We really want to have harmonic oscillation. Now, the two level system which we couple to this is the ground state and the excited state of an atom. And this is the quantum expression for this. It is h bar omega atom times sigma z. That is the operator which brings up, up or down. Okay. And this two level system, sorry, the two level system can be described as a spin one half algebra. So there are these expressions and you see this sigma set here, that's the sigma set we had here, replace this just. So this is now a spin one half system coupled to harmonic modes of vibration. And we can write it like this. So we have the degree of motion here, that's the harmonic oscillator part and it's either a ground state or an excited state. A ladder of harmonic excitations and either in the ground state in the excited state. Nothing is coupled so far. Yeah. So that's just this, this system which we have built. Harmonic confinement of a single trapped atom, and this is the internal degrees of freedom of the atom. So now we try to couple this. And how do you do it? We do it with laser light. Okay. We send in laser light. And once again, you see how important it is that this is a harmonic potential. Because that means if we go from the n equals zero with a black arrow, we go to n equals zero. But equally, we could go from n equals three to n equals three with the same laser frequency. So that is beautiful that wherever you are from n to n is this black arrow removing one phonon here. That's called the red sideband. We take the state n equals one and we go to zero, or we take the state a equals two and go to n equals one, and so on. So you can remove one phonon regardless in what state you are at the beginning. That is the beauty of the harmonic oscillator. And you can also add a phonon. You just start with n equals zero and go to n equals one. You add one phonon. And that's what you do with your laser light. So in the dressed picture, we have now coupled these this levels here, which were uncoupled before, by these interactions. Okay? And the detuning of the laser, that determines whether we drive this or this or this transition. So we have the knob for the laser detuning and can do either this or this or this, or things also in parallel. And this is now the way how we describe it. We have the dipole operator. Uh, the atomic dipole is interacting with the electric field and going from the ground state to the excited state. And that is driven with some rapid frequency and the rapid frequency depends on the electric field strength. So now we have this dipole operator in action that drives up from ground state to excited state and we can express it in the spin one half length. Yeah, because it goes from E to G or from G to E. Uh, but that's not all what it does. The laser radiation not, not only brings some energy into the system, but also some momentum, okay? Because this electric field operator has some phase that has that comes with a momentum kick with the recoil. So this was just the atomic part which drive the energy up. But there's also momentum with it. And this momentum is coming in the face of this operation. So there's an E to the I kx, that's the momentum transfer, or while the atom is excited. Okay? And now what we do is we take this momentum transfer, and before there was a kx, and now there's an atom. How do I come to this atom? Well, I take the x, which I had before, and I 
take the x and replace it by this a dagger and a. And then I come, I have this prefactor, which I showed you before. And so this k plus this prefactor, this is called the lambda of parameter. That is the amount of momentum which you can transfer to the atom. So if this eta is very small, we have an exponential function with e to the little, e to the just a bit, okay? So that means we drive the atom from the ground state to the excited state. In that moment, it's oscillating a little bit, yeah? I was wondering if, if the frequency of your trap could also contribute. Would also contribute to some something like that. As a the lag, some like, like if you get some some particular frequency, it does. It does. I come to this point, and then yeah. you get a kick from your trap, which you almost forgot about because you started thinking about. It. So, and you say the the the, the micro motion driving, so it's yeah. a fast oscillating frequency. Well, you can also then you have to teach your laser to this relative. Uh, frequency where the driving frequency. So if we take the example, uh, we have our frequency range. Here is uh, zero detuning, delta equals zero, and here we drive just between harmonic states and to end, okay? That is here. Okay, at this position. Yeah. Okay, now we can also try the blue side band, where well, maybe have something blue. That means we go from here to there. That's now this position. We are teaching blue. Okay, at this frequency, okay, that's the label. We drive this here. That's this position. And now you say we could also drive some mic motion. Well, then we have to. Make our detuning much, much more that we have. It's a flow key situation. So, every of these side bands, um, so that there's also the red. I have no point. I have red one. Yes. That when I go from here to there, that's this one. And also from, say, here to there, yeah, that's this red side band. And now the whole thing. Is coming back as a little echo here, far away. Like uh, this was my signal frequency, omega signal, and now I'm away by omega rf. Okay, and here I have a little echo of the whole system. So I'm again a red side band and a blue side band. That's a flow key solution, and on the other side, equally well. So I can also tune these lasers by this is now say this is uh, typically uh, five megahertz. I, I take this example. This is typically fifty megahertz. Then I have to so in in frequency phase, I can also go there with the laser and drive them also the secular motion. Yes. Oh. Well, just, 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 yeah. uh, I think I had a rather more simple question. Okay, sorry. <laughs> if you have this kind of pizza pendulum type yes. oscillating trap, yes. does it actually behave as a static trap in the sense that the, the, it, it will eventually relax the ground state or will it kind of Continue oscillating forever at the frequency as as, uh, as some multiple of your it, oscillation. It continues forever, so it is not. So it's never quite relaxed. It, it's never going to quite. Here we have been talking about, anyways, about the, the modes where the static confinement is active, so the the modes in the set direction and not the rated direction, but it, it confines forever. It is not kind of uh, after a while going down and then losing. No, I'm not saying that it will lose the particle. Yes. I'm saying that the particle will sort of continue oscillating in there. As it will continue feeding yeah. it it energy. It's a driven motion with a very fixed phase. So it is not a uh, temperature, but it's really a driven motion. Uh, and you can basically put 
a lot of um, the infinite amount of energy comes from the from the electric amplifier that drives this traffic. So this uh, it's not a well, how do you say it's a pure case situation and has infinite amount, infinite amount, uh, amount of uh, external energy where you can never cool this away. You, you want to cool this maybe also you cannot. Okay. Yeah? So the only chance to to get rid of this little oscillation motion is to put the eyes exactly at the center of this radio frequency position. They disappears. If you are really in in the center of the um, of, of the assembly where the quadrupole field is zero, yeah, then you have also no micro motion. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Well maybe we are good. Yeah. I have a quick question. Is this eta parameter comparable to one? How large is the magnitude parameter? Well, this is typically small. This is in the range of 10% uh, or so, 5 or 10%. And depends, of course, on the trap frequency. It depends on, see, that, that's the parameter. It depends on the mark and the, and the amount of uh, momentum transfer that comes from the laser light. So if you have UV light, this K is large. If you have infrared light, the K is small. And if you have large ions, masses like cerium ions, this mass is very heavy. And then you are dividing by a lot, or you have calcium, then the lambda is larger. But typically, we are the lab, this eta is small versus one, at least for the following, because I want to use here is again the k vector it has to do with the projection on the axis, okay, also. So that was, uh, you have to multiply this with the with the projection of this K impinge, uh, the laser comes at a certain angle of this oscillation. And this is for Raman transition here. If you go and do a Raman transition, you exchange uh, one absorbed, one stimulated emission, then the K is the difference vector. Uh, so that is. And now we are taking the approximation that this, uh, we, we try to calculate this now from ground state to excited state. When it goes from N to M. So that's the wrong phonon number, and that's the excited state for ground state. And we can separate it by an atomic dipole, and then this part here that has to do with the motion slope. And this we remember that was the rabbit frequency of the drive, and this is now this eta times A dagger plus A. And when we take the approximate that this eta is very small, yeah, and here kind of these phonon numbers are very small, then this A, dagger, and A are also giving a price too small. This is what we call the lambda regime. Okay, this is a lambda factor. And if this whole exponential has a little uh, part only, then it is the lambda regime. Okay, and in this regime, we can approximate the exponent to one plus the argument, and then it is coming into three parts. That is this delta function plus something which has to do with the red side bend and something which has to do with the blue side bend. Because this corresponds to M goes to N minus one, removing one phonon, and M goes to N plus one, adding one for it. And this prefactors N plus one, N minus one, we know from the Hamburg oscillator. And now we have these three frequencies. We have the carrier frequency, which is the Rabin frequency of the bare atom, plus minus a little uh, uh, modification. And we have the red side band and the blue side band here, adding a phonon and removing a phonon. And here it's interesting, if there's no phonons left, if the n is equal to zero, then obviously from zero, we cannot excite further because we cannot go to n minus one. Okay, there is no n minus one. So that is now the Harmon oscillator, how it works with the trap line. And here, a picture which I like. Now, this is the wave functions in momentum space for the harmonic oscillator. It's equal if I plot them in momentum space or in real space. And this eta, this eta is 
is also can be cast as a recoil frequency over the track frequency. Now I kick by the laser. If I do this, the wave functions kick a little bit. And before all the wave functions have been a, a normal system that the overlap is zero, but now due to this momentum kick, there is an overlap between this wave function and the that can now drive this transition from n equals one, uh, from n equals zero to n equals one. So then they become non-orthogonal. That's the experiment here. So we can drive the carrier by sending in laser light, which is not detuned from the atomic transition. And then we have Rabi oscillations here, or we send in blue detuned light, and then we have the sideband transition. So here we have ground state and zero phonons, here with the excited state and one form. And here we have a spin motion entanglement because we are in superposition of ground state and excited state while the motion is also in superposition of excited and not. Okay. And in the strong confining regime, now it depends what kind of line we have. Okay. If we have a very narrow line, we can select with our laser some specific frequency where we drive mostly this transition, but not this and not this, because the narrow line width allows us to select one of these transitions. Yeah. The, the, if it is, however, a very wide, wide transition, if the, 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 the line width of the transition which we select with is very wide, we cannot truly select so we drive this frequency, but that hits this and this other sidebands also. See that it's a very broad distribution because the line of the transition is broad, much broader, the gamma is much broader than the track frequency. And that may, means we can no longer select so easily with the laser. We do all of this together, <clears throat> maybe a little bit more red than, than carried the than blue sideband, but not entirely one or the other. So this is the called the weak confinement. If the line width which you have chosen of the atom is broad as compared to trap frequency, and if it is narrow, with it's called the uh, strong confinement. It's a little bit of a funny expression, but right. Okay, then now we can go to laser cooling. And laser cooling works now. Uh, Laser cooling in the, in the weak confine means we go here to this transition and then it makes a decay and we go down the ladder of harmonic excitations. Okay? The sidebands are not entirely uh, resolved. Mostly we're driving this one, but we're also driving this one and a little bit this one. And at the end, we get optimum laser cooling or the Doppler cooling here and you get some residual order number, which is described as a ratio of this line width of the transition over the trap frequency. So if you take a typical atomic transition, 20 megahertz is much wider than this five megahertz. A dipole allowed transition has one width of gamma, maybe 20 or 30 megahertz. You cannot select if you drive only the red or the blue sideband, but a little more the red, and that makes it cold. If you are in a strong confinement limit, however, you can drive selectively only the red side, and then it makes a decay, and then this way it falls down the ladder of harmonic excitations. And then you can really cool very much the ground state. And at the end, you cool to this state, and you are no longer exciting. Yeah, no longer exciting. So you go down the ladder of harmonic excitations, and you are no longer exciting this state. So there is no excitation, sorry. Here we are. There's no excitation left here. That's the signature. If we are in the ground state, we don't see any residual motion. Now, how do we detect that? This is now the ion energy levels, a very simplified word. So we have a dipole allowed transition with a, with a wide, uh, short lift state. That means it scatters a lot of photons. 
We excite on the S2P transition and after an average seven nanosecond, it falls down. And we observe these blue photons with our detector. And there's also this narrow transition here between S and D. And that has a lifetime of 1.2 seconds. So this clearly resolves the sidebands because this line width is much, much narrower than, than your, your motion degrees of freedom are separated. So how do you now detect that you are at the ground state? You are at scattering light. Okay. And if you are shelved in this level here, then this light cannot excite to the B state. Okay. If you are in this level, in this level, D by half, this light is switched. There is no press, so see, it is pressing, and then boom, it goes down. There's zero press, then it comes up. Always when it is in this D5 half state, the iron is dark. If it's the S1 half state, the ion is bright because it can no longer excite if it's in this state. So you see the quantum jumps here basically one by one. And now, if you are cooling the ion to the ground state before you have a red sideband and a blue sideband, and if you do the cooling to the ground state, then you have no longer any excitation because in the ground state, there is no excitation to this level. Yeah. From n equals zero, no excitation to n equals minus one half doesn't exist. So this line disappears. And the how good it disappears, that tells us how good the ground state is to reach. And here in this case, it was well to below a percent affection of the ground state. And you can do this for many modes. Here is a large ion crystal. With 18 axial modes, 18 ions are oscillating in very different frequencies and very different modes. Here you see all the frequencies, and you can cool all of them, and all the red sidebands then disappear after. Yeah. What limits the lifetime in the ground state? The lifetime in the ground state is infinite. Yeah, well, I, mean, I, I talk about. Mechanism that yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm coming to this. Ground state and, and so now we can choose different ions, okay? And that is exactly your question, I think. So you can either have an optical qubit, or you use this kind of superposition in ground state and excited state, but this is a meta state of state, so it has one second lifetime. This is the ground state, the true ground state, and of course, well, it can not decay the S one half state n equals minus one half or plus one half cannot decay, but this can decay, and that superposition will have a lifetime which is limited by this upper state lifetime of the D5 half. If you drive this transition, you have to do it with a very phase stable laser. Yeah? And also the eta, the lambda parameter, is very small because you have infrared light and exchange. A little bit of my optic. If you want to have larger eta, you do a Raman transition between two ground states. Now, one ground state, one ground state is in this hyperfine state, and the other ground state maybe in another hyperfine state, and you drive up and down with the Raman transition. And this way, you have basically an infinite lifetime. T1 lifetime. The T2 lifetime is, of course, depending on fluctuations of these levels, like uh, magnetic fields may uh, uh, vary also. And here in the calcium, you have no alpha fine structure because it's calcium 40, there's no nuclear spin. So you have only the outermost electron spin, which is either plus one half or minus one half. And these are the two Zeeman states of the round state. And then you're driving this transition between S one half plus one half and minus one half. And the lifetime, the T1 lifetime is infinite, as I said. The T2 lifetime depends on the magnetic field fluctuations. Yeah. And here you have uh, the qubit of the ion. So it is a ground state, we call it the spin qubit here, which has this infinite lifetime. This is the optical qubit between this state and this state. And this, this can be used 
for the readout, because then if we are in this D state, we can no longer scatter photons. If we are in this ground state S, we can scatter. So bright and dark tells us what is the state of the eye. And now this is now using this spin qubit, we initialize in the ground state, and then we drive a Raman transition for certain time duration. And here is the variation of the time duration. Okay, so we drive the qubit up to the to the excited state, and then we keep on and drive it down again. And I hope that that is now the Rabi oscillations on this uh, qubit. Okay, that really works very nice. It takes two co-propagating Raman beams, doesn't transfer any momentum on the eye, but flips the spin from up, down, up, down, always as a run. And what then- What's the units on the x-axis? Huh? What's the units on the x-axis? How long is- Well, this, this takes one, one Rabi, so the pi pulse takes about two microseconds and we can continue for about 10 to the three of this cycles, yes? Uh, so, but this way, there is no motion involved, okay? And the motion is important to entangle eyes. That's the, the basics of it. Because you can ask yourself, now we have two eyes with the spins sitting five micrometer apart from each other. What is the spin-spin reaction? Huh? We have an idea how, how large the spin-spin reaction is between these two eyes. Very, very small. So some orders of magnitude. People have measured it. That's uh, where was able to measure it. It was very complicated to measure this in spin reaction. Because it's so small, it's millihertz. Millihertz, you, you would have to wait for 100 seconds in order to make a spin dependent clip also. So it is very, very small detection. Basically zero. Huh? Because the eyes are so far apart from each other. It's very different to Rydberg systems where you have huge dipoles that they make interact, or diamond and centers where the spins are close. So that then they are interacting on themselves. But here they are not interacting. So there is no spin spin detection. But how can we then do this? Okay, how can we build spin spin detection? And the recipe is simple. You, you take a spin, you couple it to the motion. Now the motion is a common motion of everybody and you couple this motion to another spin. And this, you can effectively take the motion out. And then you have a spin, spin couple. So it's, we are the common motion. And that makes it so beautiful because now it is really long range because you marry this with a long range Coulomb detection. So whoever is participating in one mode can be this ion or this or this, all of them participating in the harmonic oscillator states can be made split spin tag. So it is mediated, it's handmade, we switch the laser on for this and we switch it off again, and then the split spin tag is done. So that's the way how we do it. We can design it, okay? And there are many, many different ways to design it. And I'm going now to, to show you the spin-dependent light force. It was first for a single ion. So we have these two Raman beams, which are forming a, a lattice, basically. And now this lattice is driving a transition between the two spin states, okay? This lattice is at an, it's not a static lattice, but these two Raman beams have a different frequency. And that means Means this lattice is now slowly moving underneath the eye. And this is the slowly moving lattice. You see the AC stark shift on the spin. And that is superposed with a blue curve that is the harmonic oscillator. And that gives this purple curve here. And you see, if I now take it and do resonantly this, I will excite the motion. Yes, that's what happens. Now, this is for a single line, and you can now excite the most the spin dependent fashion because spin up has a different light force as spin down. That is done by Klebsch Gordon configurations. And the polarization of this, you see, this is a, a, a you have to, you can make a, a force for spin up or spin down in a different way. 
Okay, now this was for a single eye. Now, how do we do it? You see here, the spin up is put in a superposition of spins, and one gets no light force, and the other one gets a light force, and it's going to end up in the displacement. So, like uh, you make a, uh, you start with spin up, then you make a superposition, and now one part of the radial packet is excited, the other one. This is Schrodinger. But we are not aiming for the single ion case, we are aiming for two ions now. And these two ions can be both in spin up, or one is spin down, one is spin up, or the other way. They are all coupled to different life forces. Now, if they are if they are coupled in a different way to the life forces, like this, one gets a push to the side, one gets an opposite push, the net push is net zero. There's no push on this one. There's no push on this one. But this one gets a push, and this one gets another push. Okay. And so you can make a light force which is spin dependent and it is collectively spin dependent. And that makes us that leads to the fact that you can generate bell states. And here is the mathematics of this. You have these two laser, laser fields with lin per lin. Uh, polarization and that forms a drape and a lattice of polarization. Now the ions get a kick, which is spin dependent, and this leads to a displacement. Now what we do, we don't want to end up with a lot of displacement of the ions. We just want to use the displacement for the moment of the gate, but then we want to get rid of the displacement afterwards. So what we do, we are detuning from there's the oscillating frequency of the ion. If you would push this down exactly in resonance, it would start to make the coherent excitation larger and larger. But we are a little bit off the tune. That's like a, a spring which you would excite a little bit off resonance. After a while, the spring is oscillating, but now you are opposite phase and taking the oscillation out of it. Okay. So we have a, a displacement which is first large, and then because we are detuned, it becomes zero again, and here we have to stop. So we have to make a displacement pulse which brings us around this circle. And that is, the detuning is relevant for making the circle closed. If the detuning is zero, then this would raise, 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 and go more and higher, and higher. the amplitude will become, the oscillation amplitude will become ever larger. At the end, we don't want to have any displacement. So we start here, we do a displacement in a spin dependent fashion, and only some spin configurations can do this, other spin configurations don't do it. And if the enclosed area is exactly right, then we get a phase factor here for this spin components, both spins down, both spins up. But these guys, one is up, one is down, one is up, one is down they don't experience any uh, phase factor. And this can be used to make, if you choose amplitude and tuning and return time where you switch off your laser again, if you choose this right, you make a gate operation. And the gate operation would we reach our 99.5% accuracy of bell states also. So I think I have no time left for the heat transport. But I'm all set for this in the next uh, lecture. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So the um, we have. Um, yeah, let's say next one. Um, so this is the edge one half state, and that has the plus and the minus state. Plus one half, minus one half. And now you have the P state here. And this P state and also plus and minus one half, okay? So there's uh, different levels, and 
Now we drive the transition and well, maybe I draw more. Sorry. Ah, okay. So this is the plus one half, this is minus one half. And here in the P state, we have also two states. And now you know this is a clash coordinate coefficients. This is another one. This is another one. And this is another one. They all have different strength. Here, this is the strongest one. So if you drive sigma plus, right? This one, however, is zero. So this gets an AC stack shift. This doesn't get an AC stack shift. So depending on the position where you are, you get a light shift for this guy only. This guy doesn't care, <laughs> okay? So that is a spin-dependent light force. Um, yeah, but it means you control your polarization. Yeah, we, we, we have, yeah, as I said, as I said, we have these two polarizations, yeah? Lin curved in, and that makes a standing wave in polarization. So we have some places where the polarization is such, and some other places where uh, we have to position the eyes, of course. Uh, I showed this, yes. So this is, uh, here they are sitting. They have to sit really in the right place. This, uh, that's, the, that's the art that you put them really in the right position where they really feel this type of light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if, for example, the eye crystal would be tilted a bit, it doesn't work, okay? Yeah. We also make it conditional. Yes. It the condition. Okay. Absolutely. Good. It is conditional on the spin state, yes. So, yeah. But it's based on this Clebsch Gordon coefficient ideas. And of course, there is also the P half level, and you can have more tricks of, of similar kind. But, nice. So let's take a, if there are no other questions for this. Okay. Let's take a very short break. And I think I'm going to encourage those of you. Fair enough. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.